Hello, I'm Thomas Abihana, a global security analyst here at Stratfor, and this podcast is brought to you by Stratfor Worldview, the world's leading geopolitical intelligence platform. Individual, team, and enterprise memberships are available at worldview.stratfor.com slash subscribe. Russians have the capability to disrupt our power grid, at least for a short time. We've seen the Russians do that in Ukraine now twice, and I I don't think we're ready for that. Welcome to the Stratfor Podcast. I'm Faisal Pervez. On today's Pen and Sword Podcast with Fred Burton, we're having a conversation about cybercrime and how to resist attacks. Richard A. Clark and Robert Kanaki have written The Fifth Domain, defending our country, our companies, and ourselves in the age of cyber threats. Clark is one of the foremost experts on cybersecurity and served as counterterrorism coordinator under two U.S. presidents. Kanaki served in the Obama White House as director for cybersecurity policy at the National Security Council. In The Fifth Domain, Clark and Kanaki discuss cyber resilience ways that governments and businesses can build systems to resist attacks and raise the cost of hacking for bad actors. Stratfor's chief security officer, Fred Burton, recently spoke to Kanaki. Let's listen in. Hi, I'm Fred Burton here today with Robert Kanaki, who has written The Fifth Domain along with Richard Clark. The book is Defending Our Country, Our Companies, and Ourselves in the Age of Cyber Threats, and it's published by Penguin Press. And by way of background, Robert served in the Obama White House as the Director for Cybersecurity Policy at the National Security Council. Robert, thank you for joining Stratfor Talks today. Good to be with you. Robert, tell me a little bit about the book, The Fifth Domain. So in in some ways, The Fifth Domain is a sequel to the 2010 book that Richard Clark and I published called Cyber War. Uh, That book, Cyber War and the Next Threat to National Security, was really to sort of raise the alarm about cyber threats, to get get it on people's radar. Uh, If you can think back that far, that was a time when cyber issues weren't on the cover of the New York Times every single day. And so we were trying to raise awareness and motivate policy around the subject. We wrote this book about a decade later because we think things have changed fairly significantly. And when we looked at the topic again, uh, we realized we were wrong about a couple things. And one of the main things we were wrong about was that cybersecurity is actually possible today, that there are companies uh, that are effectively managing the threat from even the worst actors. And so we wanted to get a, a message out that updated the topic, but also made it clear that we think things have actually gotten better in some ways, not worse. You say, Robert, in the book, uh, the next major war with the U.S. will be provoked by a cyber attack. I think that topic would be very interesting for our listeners. Could you explain why you think that might be the case? Yeah, I mean, so there are many positive aspects about what's happened in cyberspace over the last decade, but let's go let's go negative for a minute. Uh, the negative is that Many countries have developed capabilities that are challenging the United States in cyberspace now. Uh, if they can't go toe to toe with the U.S. military on land, on sea, in the air, or in space, uh, they can go toe to toe in cyberspace because of the proliferation of offensive cyber capabilities. It's relatively cheap and relatively easy. And so countries like North Korea and Iran, just to take two that have been in the news recently, have developed very sophisticated offensive capabilities. Those capabilities are likely to get used. Those capabilities are likely to be what Iran chooses to escalate any further tensions with uh, in response to any further US actions. So what we've seen in the tit for tat with Iran in particular is that cyber has played a, a role Uh, in which we don't always know what the effects of that are going to be. It's not necessarily as predictable as weapons in other domains. And so we think that increases the chance for uh, miscalculation. So, Robert, if I hear you correctly, with the potential for hostilities in the Middle East, and Iran is certainly an actor that everybody's worried about today, the United States 
could envision a scenario where Iran utilizes their cyber cap- capacities and attacks us. Do you think that also means that they would go after, let's say, American companies? I think that that's highly likely. I mean, we've seen Iran do that in the past. Back when I was in the White House, uh, 2012, 2013, and 2014, the Iranians were carrying out a fairly sophisticated campaign of distributed denial of service attacks against U.S. banks. This is uh, in retaliation for uh, the alleged attack on their uh, nuclear infrastructure known as Stuxnet. And so they've, they've done it before. Uh, I think it's likely that they will do it again. If they're going to strike in the U.S. homeland, it's more likely than not going to be through cyberspace rather than trying to put any kind of conventional force uh, into U.S. waters or onto U.S. soil. I think they may, however, not know how the U.S. government would react to that attack at this time. I think it could be very different uh, than in the past. When you're looking at another nation state actor that appears to be in the news every day when it comes to cyber, Russia, what play would they have from a targeting perspective? And is Russia's targets different than what, let's say, Iran would be? Well, I think we need to understand what Russia's objective is with their offensive cyber capability. Uh, Right now, Russia seems intent on sowing division in the United States. That's their goal, right? And so their election interference needs to be understood in that vein. And everything else that they've been doing in cyberspace needs to be understood in that vein. So it's a, a very different set of interests than the Iranians have. The Iranians seem to want to use cyber as a weapon to achieve conventional military objectives. The Russians, on the other hand, want to use it to sow discord and discontent and division in the United States. So their targets are going to be very different. And so let's talk about North Korea. What would their targets be? So the North Koreans are just an amazing... Uh, phenomenon uh, of modern modern warfare, where they're actually not focused on disruption or destruction, but on making money. Uh, their cyber capabilities are almost wholly focused at this point on bringing in hard currency to the North Korean regime, and so they're they're effectively acting as a nation state kleptocracy uh, using their cyber offensive capabilities, which are fairly formidable to uh, engage in theft, to pull off ransomware attacks, to take money out of the uh, Federal Reserve System. So that's what the North Koreans are up to. What actors are out there on the fringe that keep you up at night, Robert? Well, the biggest concern that I see is this is this proliferation of capabilities. It used to be, right, when, when Dick and I wrote the first book, the level of nation state capability was really only in a, a few actors' hands, it, you know, maybe five, maybe seven, depending on how you would have counted in 2008. But it was the United States, followed by Russia, China, Israel, France. Uh, now you add North Korea to that mix. Now you add Iran to that mix. But the problem is that on the dark web, you can go out and purchase capabilities uh, for a fairly small amount of money that will be every bit as sophisticated as those five, six, and seventh players on that list. And so it's that mercenary component that is a real game changer. So that's one. The other issue I would raise is that these criminal groups are on their own becoming every bit as sophisticated as some of these nation state actors. And so if you've watched the ransomware incidents unfold, Five years ago, ransomware was barely heard of. It was something that was targeting only home users who had old computers that hadn't been updated that weren't using antivirus. Now we're seeing ransomware take out whole cities, targeting the power grid in South Africa, uh, and we're seeing it utilize uh, zero-day vulnerabilities. So this is an advanced capability in these criminal groups. And as more money flows to them, they're buying more sophisticated capabilities so they can take down larger and larger targets. Do you see asymmetric kind of terrorist organizations looking at cyber as a way to come at the United States or the West? So the, the terrorist boogeyman has has been out there since shortly after 9-11. There was a lot of concern then, right, that terrorists would 
see our vulnerabilities in cyberspace and take advantage of them. Uh, that really hasn't happened in the last 18 years. And, and I think it's for a couple reasons. I think you know, the, the first and the one that's at the top of the list is if you're a terrorist organization, you really do want to generate a headline. You want to have an explosion. You want something that you can very visibly take credit for. You don't want attribution to unfold over several months. You don't want the effects of your actions to remain hidden or be misattributed to a error or a problem that you did not cause. And so I think for that reason, uh, we've seen terrorists direct their resources into other avenues. Terrorists use the internet kind of much the same way that uh, everybody else uses it. They use it for training, they have videos, they use it for recruitment, they're all over social media. They use it to organize and plan just like we do, uh, but they haven't thought that it made a lot of sense to invest uh, in offensive cyber capabilities. Uh, I think the other reason that they haven't invested in it is that disruptive cyber attacks, uh, while there are a growing number of state actors who can carry them out, uh, it still requires quite a substantial investment. And so for them to build a capability where they could say, turn out the lights in New York City, uh, might not be, on, be beyond their means, but it might not get them the effect that they want that they could get with a, with a kinetic attack. We'll get back to the fifth domain in just a moment. The fifth domain is the Pentagon's term for cyberspace. It can be a confusing and difficult terrain to navigate, but as Clark and Kanaki lay out in their book, it's a world where forward thinking and forward planning is critical. Stratfor helps businesses identify, monitor, and manage risk by uncovering the trends most likely to disrupt your company's operations and people and help you develop risk contingency plans. If you're not already a member, you can find out more at stratfor.com slash enterprise. Now, back to the studio. Robert, do you see nation states like Iran or Russia utilizing or outsourcing this to contractors? Well, we're seeing that all the time. I mean, I think that the idea that there's strict divisions between, uh, say, the Chinese PLA cyber actors and Chinese criminal actors is just wrong. Uh, we've seen on any number of occasions uh, that these actors will be moonlighting uh, for criminal groups or will be criminal groups acting at the behest or on behalf of the state. And so when we've seen indictments come down from the U.S. Justice Department, many times the activity looks very much criminal in nature. It's very hard to see a motivation that's actually on behalf of the state in all of their actions. And so, yeah, there's, there's absolutely a uh, connection between uh, the criminal activity and the supported nation state activity. Robert, I, I know we've talked a lot about uh, all the potential threats that are out there that are coming our way, but uh, as a former special agent myself, I know we're pretty darn good in this arena ourselves. So talk a little bit about some of the positive developments in the 10 years between your first book and and now the fifth domain that have that have come around, at least it's, it's kept us at the forefront of this issue? Well, you know, the, f the first is attribution, and, and we've touched on that already. Uh, there was a view a decade ago that attribution in cyberspace was all but impossible. I, I, I think that that's no longer widely viewed as the case within, within the industry. Attribution is certainly hard. It's certainly not as easy as uh, tracking a missile from North Korea inbound to the United States. Uh, but it is, I think, a, an art that we've grown increasingly good at. Uh, and if you look at the indictments that I've already referenced as, as evidence of that, um, they show a very good degree of ability by the U.S. government to attribute cyber attacks. So in the, in the cases that I was most involved with when I was in government on Chinese economic espionage, uh, we didn't just attribute the espionage to the state of China. We didn't just attribute it to the PLA. Uh, we didn't just attribute it down to a building that they worked out of. Uh, we brought it down to the individual uh, actors, down to their faces, their names, their hacker handles, 
uh, their ranks, we were able to say, here's the guy and put his picture onto a wanted poster. So we've gotten that good at attribution. I think that's a major change. So what you're telling me is you have the ability to put uh, a face to the keyboard. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've done that on any number of occasions and we've done it fairly recently. If, if you look at the indictments uh, related to the election hacking carried out by Russia, uh, we were absolutely able to do that. Uh, it, it's a, it is, as I said, a, an art more than a science at this point, but the ability to say we know who in fact was behind this action is pretty good. And it takes the use of intelligence in all forms to be able to do that. But it's very hard to totally hide your hand today in cyberspace if you're going to do something fairly significant. And as you look at that too, from a operational capability, what advice would you give to listeners, uh, our corporations as to the best practices to try to defend themselves from, let's say, a nation state attack? Let's start with mindset. Uh, one of the things that, that we confronted 10 years ago was this belief that the offense had this overwhelming advantage and that defense was not possible. And therefore, that it really wasn't fair to turn to corporations and say, hey, you have to defend yourself against Russian or Chinese APT actors. The answer then was that's all but impossible to do. Uh, well, the first thing that we'd want to correct is, is that belief. Uh, it is actually possible and it, and it can be done. In the book, one of the things that we cite is we say that more than any technology, more than any product on the market, more than any algorithm that's been written, the greatest contribution to cybersecurity uh, of the last decade was really a white paper. And it was a white paper written by a couple of guys who worked in the CERT at uh, Lockheed Martin. Uh, and it was called Intelligence Driven Security. And this introduced the concept of the kill chain. And the guys who wrote it, uh, they wrote it because they were tired of this view that defense was impossible, that the offense could be everywhere, that the offense only had to be right once and defense had to be right every time. And so they borrowed the concept of the kill chain uh, from the Air Force, right, which is used to say, what are the steps we need to do to put a bomb on target? They said, well, what are the steps that an adversary needs to do to get data out of our network? And they broke it up into seven steps and they said, okay, well, if we can disrupt the adversary, detect and disrupt them at any one of those seven steps, we win. For them to succeed, they've got to make it through all of those seven set steps without being detected. And so that, I think, was the biggest change we've seen over the decade. It was realizing that the defense job actually is in some ways easier than the offense job. Yeah, that's very interesting, Robert. I think if you, if you take that mentality and you start structuring your defense around that concept, uh, cybersecurity goes from something that seems to be all but impossible to something that is actually doable even by a you know, mid-sized corporation, even one that is being targeted by the, by the most advanced adversary. What other practical advice would you give to the individual that's worried about uh, ransomware or something as basic as their credit cards being hacked? So there, there's two levels to the advice, right? One level is basic cyber hygiene will take you out of the target, right? If you are running an up-to-date system with up-to-date software on your phone and on your home computer, uh, if you are running some package of uh, advanced malware detection, if you are trying to not click on every link that comes into your inbox offering to uh, make you rich through a Nigerian prince, uh, <laughs> you're probably going to be okay. We have a whole chapter on this uh, in the book. Uh, we recommend that everybody use a password manager, that everybody use multi-factor authentication on that password manager and everywhere else. That's a very practical step that everyone can take. Uh, but beyond that, then our advice is to sit back and relax and don't worry so much. Your data has been stolen. It's available on the dark web. 
We all know that. What we have to rely on now is the fact that we're increasingly making it difficult to monetize that data. That's the job of the financial community, and they're working very hard on that. And the reason they're working hard on that is because at this time, uh, under current law, they're responsible. If your data uh, gets stolen by Capital One, Capital One is uh, on the hook if your bank account gets drained. Uh, that's not on you. And so from a certain perspective, you actually don't need to worry too much about the harms uh, that can behaul you. So essentially, you know, monitor your credit and go on with your business is probably the best advice. Robert, if you go back to your first book and now with the fifth domain, it looks like you got a 10-year block. If you had to forecast, and I know I'm probably uh, asking you to look over the horizon, and I, I don't know if you and Richard Clark have another book plan, but uh, what is over the horizon in this space? What What is the next frontier when you start looking at uh, cyber? Well, so I, I think the answer is going out 10 years, we can see uh, two trajectories. One is that if the trajectory that we're on continues, uh, security is going to get better and better. It's going to get harder and harder for an adversary to succeed. Uh, this is the scenario in which uh, we win. The other scenario, the more dire one, is one in which technology evolves in a direction that makes us less secure. And so there are certain technology trends that we're looking at right now, which could take us in either of those directions. Uh, I think we ultimately don't know at this point whether something like cloud computing is going to ultimately uh, seem like a, a good idea that it actually will give us that benefit for small businesses, bringing the capability that only a large enterprise, say, had for security uh, to the middle market. Um, other even more advanced technology trends could also go either way. We really don't know what the effects of quantum computing uh, will be on cybersecurity. Will it actually be a benefit for security or will it be a benefit for attackers? Uh, the one that I think is playing out right now in a really fascinating way is artificial intelligence. We've seen some great advances with artificial intelligence in terms of being able to detect malware. And we've seen lots of companies that are doing that well at this point. And that's undoubtedly making the attacker's life harder. But artificial intelligence uh, is also giving the attackers the ability to recreate your voice, to recreate your face, to create a video of you talking. Uh, and that is very difficult to detect. So that can give uh, the attackers a tremendous advantage. And so it's really a question of what way are these technology trends going to go and, and who's going to be able to harness them better, the, uh, the offenders or the defense? Yeah, that's a pretty frightening scenario when you start thinking about that, the ability for a hacker to... Uh... Uh, to, I, I guess, utilize or to clone your voice and your face and so forth? Well, I mean, if you if you begin thinking about the effect that being able to create a, a fake social media account had uh, on the 2016 election, now imagine that um, you get a phone call uh, from, you know, your sister and it's, hey, um, hey, bro, um, I can't remember what, uh, what our mother's maiden name was. And you're like, well, gee, sis, that's, that's pretty odd, but here's what it is. You're going to answer that. Well, that's where the technology is going and, and the scale and the affordability of it will be such that you may just see attacks that are that targeted, that simple and that basic duping you into revealing security information. That's why we need to come up with a, a whole different paradigm of, of how we do security, because the things that we rely on like that, like being able to recognize somebody's voice that we've heard our whole life uh, may no longer work. Yeah, that's uh, that's amazing. And, and then you, you throw in the nation state capabilities of being able to utilize that, let's say, even on a espionage or an insider threat kind of uh, manner. And th those are very problematic, especially for your counterintelligence kind of uh, defenses, if you start looking at, you know, how do you protect uh, 
your employees inside the, you know, the FBI, NSA, CIA, or whatever? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think the, the scenario I gave right then was pretty basic, but I mean, the other ones that you could really see playing out um, would be criminal uh, for, you know, just taking money out of your bank, right? Right now, we tell um, everybody uh, who will listen to us, right? If you get an email telling you, you know, hey, this is your boss, please wire this money, uh, pick up the phone and call them. Uh, and confirm that they actually sent you that email because your email may have been infiltrated and you may not be able to trust that. Well, what if you receive a phone call from your boss telling you to do that? Right. Somebody taken and replicated their voice. How are you going to defend against that? I mean, that's going to require bringing security uh, to a whole new level with a whole new threat vector that's going to be very different than the kind of threat vectors that, that we're managing today. Robert, uh, what keeps you up at night? after spending a career here in the cyberspace, what, what, what are you really worried about? Well, I think the one that, that we both uh, emphasize uh, in the book and uh, before and since is, is the electric grid. Uh, the vulnerability of the U.S. Uh, electric grid to disruption is, is not disputed. Uh, we cite, uh, we use releases from the Director of National Intelligence uh, that say point blank that the Russians have the capability to disrupt our power grid, at least locally uh, and at least for a short time. That's on the low end. We can take that as fact. We've seen the Russians do that in Ukraine now twice. And we ask ourselves looking at the Ukraine attacks, well, you know, why would the Russians do that? Why would they carry out a cyber attack to take out the power in Ukraine. If they want to take out the power in Ukraine, they can literally just go in and unplug it. I mean, they they own half the country uh, for all uh, intents and purposes at this point. And so when we look at those attacks, we say, well, that's a trial run, right? That's them figuring out this capability, figuring out how to use it on a target where they wouldn't have the ability to go kinetic, where they wouldn't have the ability to cross the border and uh, shut down the power. And so we think that's a capability that they're perfecting for use against the United States when the time comes. And I, I don't think we're ready for that uh, societally. I don't think we're ready for that uh, governmentally. And so that's, that's my biggest concern. And that's certainly a frightening scenario. I, and I do think that's a good place to uh, end. Robert, I greatly appreciate you being on Stratfor Talks today. Uh, the book is The Fifth Domain, Defending Our Country, Our Companies, and Ourselves in the Age of Cyber Threats by Robert Kanaki and Richard Clark, and it's published by Penguin Press. Uh, Robert, thank you so much for being with us today. Good to be with you. Thanks for joining us for today's Pen and Sword podcast with Robert Kanaki and Fred Burton. We'll have details about the fifth domain, as well as links to Stratfor's cyber threat analysis in our show notes. If you're interested in learning how Stratfor can partner with you to keep ahead of global geopolitical developments, be sure to visit stratfor.com slash enterprise. Please leave a review on the podcast page in iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. For more geopolitical intelligence and links to our content, Follow us on Twitter at Stratfor. I'm Faisal Pervez. Thanks for listening.